I want to I wanna come around this idea today that we've themed God loves surprises. God loves surprises. That's what I want to talk about today. And just because I'm curious, how many of you would say by a showing of hands that you love surprises? Can I see your hand if you love surprises? Oh, wow. Look at, look at all those hands. Okay. <laughs> how many of you say you don't like surprises? Like, don't, don't surprise me. Let me see your hand. <laughs> I'm laughing because you lifted up your hand in response to the question. All the people that said I love surprises, your hands went up quick, like it was a spelling bee and you knew how to spell the word. <laughs> All the people who said, I don't like surprises, your hands just kind of went up slow. <laughs> like, look, I didn't even know you were going to ask me this question. Don't surprise. Don't surprise me. I, I got another question. How many of you don't like surprises and yet you love surprising other people? Can I see your hand? <laughs> Keep it up. Yeah. That's all the control freaks right there. <laughs> I'm going to lift up my hand. I'm going to lift up my hand. I'm going to let you know. I don't like surprises. I do not like surprises. I ain't going to say I hate them. I, I strongly <laughs> dislike surprises. Matter of fact, if you are going to surprise me, tell me, okay? <laughs> let me know. I don't need to know the details of how you're going to surprise me, but at least give me a heads up, okay? Let, give a brother a little bit of warning. Just like, let me know. If there's like a surprise party Thursday night for me and I don't know, I don't need to know the restaurant details, but let me know. Hey, you might want to dress up tonight. You know, let me know how I need to brush my teeth before I go to this <laughs> event. Let, let me know. Don't have me pulling up like in gym shorts when it's my surprise party. And I say that with specificity because by far the greatest surprise of my life occurred 10 years ago now. 10 years ago, my 30th birthday, my beautiful bride, the lovely Taylor Madu, surprised me. She got me so good, y'all. We were chilling at the crib. It was just a casual day. And she said, hey, babe. You want to go to the mall? I said, right now? She said, yeah. I said, you feel like it? She's like, if you feel like it. I said, cool. Let's go to the mall. I threw on some gym shorts, and I just go to the mall. And there we are. It's a regular day. We're perusing around the mall, having a good time. Normal mall day with my boo, Zara, three and a half hours, chilling. <laughs> and we come out, and she's like, hey, you ready to eat? I'm like, yeah, I could eat. I could eat where you want to go. She's like, wherever you want to go. I said, we're right here in the mall. We may as well go to Maggiano's. She said, oh. Marciano's is cool. Looking back, I should have known right there something was up because she ain't never decided <laughs> where she wants to eat that quick. I should have known. Ah, hold up. <laughs> How come there wasn't no debate about this? So we go to Maggiano's. I will never forget this. We walk in. We say party of two. They're like right this way. They take us upstairs. I was like, this is odd. Never been upstairs before. But I still wasn't thinking anything. We walk upstairs and sure enough, I open a door. I'm like, why am I going through a door to be seated? And there it is, a room full of all of my family and friends, and they all shouted, surprise! And I jumped back, and once my blood pressure came back down, I said, oh, oh, my, oh my goodness, what didn't you tell me? I got on gym shorts. It was an awesome time, and we had some chicken parmesan, had an amazing little 30th birthday, but... The surprise continued. Got back to the crib. She said, babe, you're really going to like this next surprise. I'm like, well, I'm still recovering from the last one. She said, pack your bags because I'm taking you to New York City. I said, New York City? She said, yeah. She said, you are going to go see a raisin in the sun. I'm taking you to go see Denzel Washington on Broadway. I said, quit playing. She said, no, I'm serious. We're going to go see Denzel on Broadway. Now, that's not a big deal to you, but that's a big deal to me because I just want to declare I am a day one diehard Denzel Washington fan, okay? I'm just going to say this for the record, okay? He's an arguably the greatest actor to ever live, okay? It's not up for debate. That is my dude, Denzel Washington. I'm not a new Denzel fan, you know, the new one, because he's still killing it right now. You know what I'm saying? Just still killing it as an old man, killing people as an assassin. I'm talking about old school Denzel back in the day. Glory, remember Glory? When his bottom lip was out and just made one tear come down his cheek. You know how good of an actor you got to be to make one tear come down your cheek? I'm a Denzel fan, so I am going crazy. I'm about to go see Denzel. Denzel live on Broadway. I'll never forget it. We get to the Broadway show and 
hour early, there I am, front row. You understand what this moment means for me? Up until this point, I have only seen Denzel Washington on a screen at a distance in a movie theater. I'm about to see this man, Coach Boone, y'all, Frank Lucas. I'm about to see him in the flesh. So I'm going crazy just being in the Broadway theater and I never forget it. And I sat there, all of a sudden the curtain comes up and y'all, when Denzel came out in the flesh, I'm sorry, I panicked. I went like a Taylor Swift fan. I'm not making this up. I don't know why my hands, my hands ain't supposed to come up here. But I just, I just scream because there he is in the flesh. Up until this point, I have only seen him on a screen. I'm not playing with you. I'm watching the Broadway play. I'm about right where you are, right there, watching Denzel. There was a moment in the play where he got real passionate. He said, what are you talking about? He said, what are you talking about? As soon as he said talk, some of the spit off of Denzel's lip came all the way off and big just hit me in the chest. I said, babe, this is the greatest gift <laughs> of my entire life. It was a moment. I will never forget, and we watched the play, and I got my program, and I'm skipping in the streets of New York, and I'm about to get in the cab and leave. And all of a sudden, I look at my peripheral, and I see right next to the theater, there's a little alleyway with the door. And there's a group of people by the door, not a massive crowd, just a few people by the door, and I was about to get in my cab and mind my business, but that door was calling my name. And I couldn't understand why that group of people were sitting right there by the door, standing there. So I, I said, babe, hold on, hold on. She was pregnant at the time. She's like, are you serious? I said, just let me see what this situation is about. And I go over there, and uh, it's a group of people, mainly women, they're waiting. I said, oh, what y'all doing? <laughs> why why, why y'all standing <laughs> by this door, by the theater? They said, oh, well, all of the actors and actresses from the play are going to come out of this door. I said, all of them? <laughs> They said, well, sometimes Mr. Washington sneaks out the back, but other times he'll come and he'll shake a few hands. I said, you trying to tell me Coach Boone, Frank Lucas might come through that door and I can shake his hand. They said, we don't know. So I'm standing there with a group of ladies. I'm like, babe, please just wait. And I'm just waiting. I was like, I got to wait. And we waited and we waited. A few of the actors came out. I was like, ah, okay, not, not, not Coach Boone. Come on, come on. I waited. I waited. And y'all, sure enough, I heard his voice before I saw him. I hear, I hear Denzel's voice. He comes out. He walks to the right side first, shook a few hands there, and then he turns and comes straight towards me, looking at me in my face like he knew he's a day one. <laughs> he walks straight up to me. He shakes my head. But let me tell you the moment before. Y'all, I'm so nervous because have you ever met your hero before in real life? Because my head is shaking because I got to shake with one hand, but then if you don't capture it, it didn't exist. So I got to get the picture with the other hand so one hand is shaking with the camera making sure I get the image and the other hand is shaking before I even shake his hand because I got to do a snap and a shake it's a snap and a shake and y'all I nailed it can I show y'all the picture of the snap and shake put, put that picture on the screen of the snap and shake. Ah! you see it you see it you ain't impressed zoom in zoom in 10 years ago this is an iPhone 3 you see it? One more zoom. Watch it, watch it. That's my hand in Denzel's hand. <laughs> That's my hand. Keep it up there for a long time. That's my hand. And that's Denzel's hand. <laughs> Touching. My hand has never been the same ever since. And I share that with you today. And I leave that picture up there as blurry as it is. Because ladies and gentlemen, that picture right there to me is a picture of the power of Christmas. I, I use my Denzel story as a feeble attempt to articulate the magic, the wonder, the beauty, the mystery, the enchantment of this season that we are in called Christmas today. I'm using that picture and this experience to try to convey to you the power of what Jesus did when he put on human skin and he came down through 42 gener generations and came close to us. 
close enough to touch and maybe you can't get excited about that but you don't understand that all of humanity we were stuck in our sins we had no hope of redemption there is nobody that could have gotten us out of the mess of sin there was a breach there was a chasm between us and God and how many of you know God because he is holy and we are not he was as distant as Denzel on a screen and we couldn't get close to him and we couldn't touch him and how many of you know for centuries and for years we were waiting and hoping and praying seeing glimpses of redemption but never walking in the effulgence of the redemption until one day all of a sudden in Bethlehem how many are thankful that Jesus showed up in a manger the God that we could not touch became touchable the intangible became tangible and all of a sudden we could behold the wonder of his glory the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth that's Christmas Christmas is not that we have a God that you can see from a distance on the screen Christmas is the power of a savior who comes close close enough to touch close enough to be held close enough to be right in your situation no wonder this is the surprise that changed the course of human history the surprise of Jesus showing up in a manger is the only surprise that changed the course of history let me be clear it was no surprise that he was coming because there are over 300 Old Testament prophecies that let us know he was coming. He was always on his way. As a matter of fact, before the foundation of the earth, the lamb was slain. Let me just break that down and let you know before we even made a mistake, God already had a plan in place. How many know God doesn't ever have to play the rebound? He already had a plan in place for the fall of humanity. It was no surprise that he was coming. But how he came, ooh, that was a surprise. Nobody would have ever guessed manger in Bethlehem. Nobody would have ever guessed that God would have become a baby. I mean, come on, think about it. If it was you, would you come as a baby? No, I'm letting you know right now. If I'm coming to earth to rescue humanity from their sins, I am not coming as a baby. I'm coming full grown. Full grown. I'm not doing a baby. I'm not even doing puberty. I am showing up full grown and I'm not showing up in Bethlehem I might show up probably in New York City I'm coming in the world full grown with hair on my chest I'm gonna look like the rock I'm gonna have a tattoo on one bicep called righteousness another tattoo on this bicep called peace and on the back of me I'm gonna have a big old tat that says the government <laughs> church joke the government shall be on his okay I'm that's how I'm coming full grown but not Jesus Surprise, surprise, I'm going to show up in no name Bethlehem. I'm going to show up to no name Mary. Whoo, Mary got a surprise. Can you see Mary making her wedding plan saying, yeah, this is going to be a beautiful wedding. It's going to be chill. I don't want no drama at this wedding. My wedding is going to be peaceful and calm. Surprise! Here's Gabriel. Hail Mary. <laughs> you are highly favored. She was highly favored and then went through hell. Highly favored and went through ridicule. Highly favored and then was ostracized and alienated. See, you think favor is you get in the car. But Mary proves that sometimes favor is going through pain. Sometimes favor looks like people who should embrace you actually reject you. And she gets a surprise. And after she got her surprise, you're about to give birth to the Son of the Living God. Guess who else got the surprise? Joseph. <laughs> Let me help all the people who are dating. Be careful who you pick because their surprise is going to become your surprise. Matter of fact, even if you pick the right one and go through premarital counseling, can I just let you know, if you're going to make it the long run in that relationship, I promise you, you're going to have a whole lot of surprises. And all of a sudden, Joseph gets surprised with the news. And Joseph was about to walk away, but he gets a surprise. It says, Mary, and says, Joseph, this is of the Lord. And he stays with her. I could go throughout the entire Christmas story and tell you surprise after surprise. And the reason is God loves surprises. I want you to look at your neighbor because you haven't looked at him in a minute and just say, neighbor, stop tripping. God loves surprises. 
Look at your other neighbor, say, other neighbor, you're my second option. But if you're surprised right now, it might be God. Oh, can anybody testify to the fact that God loves to surprise you? Rarely does God give you a 10-year plan. Rarely does God come down with a PowerPoint presentation and say, ah, this is what's going to happen in year two. No, he just surprises you. And here's why I think God loves surprises. It's because surprise is an interesting emotion. It's different than fear. It's different than anxiety that can be in your life for a while. How many know the duration of surprise is different? It's only for a moment. Come on, you're not perpetually surprised. <laughs> you don't see anybody just walk around. If anybody walk around like this, they're not perpetually surprised. They just had a lot of Botox. It's just, <laughs> surprise. Surprise is something that just happens in a moment. And I think being surprised is God's favorite emotion and here's why it's his favorite emotion. is because surprising somebody, the function of surprise rather, is to focus our attention so we can determine what's happening. Whenever you are surprised, the moment is almost disorienting. And the purpose of the moment is to focus your attention so you can determine what's happening. So the reason I'm arguing that being surprised is God's favorite emotion is because God wants your attention. He's trying to get your attention. That thing you're going through right now, ooh, that's God. Trying to get you to focus in, and he wants your attention. And the reason he wants your attention is because he knows if he could ever get your attention, he could change the direction of your life. If God could ever get your attention, he could change the trajectory of your life. He surprised Mary, but that's not surprising. We knew that it had to be a woman that was going to be overshadowed. So that's not really a surprise in the Christmas story. He surprised Joseph. And let's be honest, Joseph is not really a surprise. But come on, Joseph is of the lineage of David. And the Messiah had to come through the lineage of David. So that's not really a surprise too. I'm not even surprised that Zechariah, who was a high priest, and him and Elizabeth got a surprise. But it had already been prophesied that the one who was going to make the way had to have a way prepared. And John the Baptist was already foretold. So that, 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 wasn't, that wasn't a surprise. Can I tell you who in the Christmas story has the greatest surprise that I'm still to this moment trying to figure out how did they get in the story? It's in Luke chapter 2, verse number 8. This is the group of people that I'm trying to figure out why are they in the story? It says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the, say it, Shepherds. the who? Shepherds. The who? Shepherds. Say it with your chest. The who? Shepherds. Said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened. I don't know why I had that voice, but I think the shepherds just sound like they're from Alabama. Let's go to Bethlehem. <laughs> see this thing that's happened, <laughs> which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. The who that I'm surprised of in the Christmas story are the shepherds. Why in the world would God choose to give the only heavenly host angelic announcement to a bunch of shepherds who are out in the field? You understand, this is the only group of people they got a whole host of angels to make the announcement. Y'all, Mary only got one angel. Joseph got one. All of a sudden, these no-name shepherds who are out in the field get a whole heavenly host of angels? I like how the angels work because they didn't start with the heavenly host. I don't know how many of the hosts was, maybe a thousand, but it started off with one. <laughs> he said, y'all, y'all stay in the back. We're going to kill them. Just hold on. <laughs> and the first angel showed up and said, hey! 
and greeted them first. And then after the first one, then came the host. Can I just pause right here and fix uh, some of our angelology real quick? Because sometimes our art that we look at, it affects our imagination. And so when you think angel, you think of what? The picture of the angel, right? That The little, little white baby, little Gerber baby. You know how they do that? <laughs> you, you think that's what the angel looked like. But I want to argue, how come every single time an angel showed up in the Bible, the first words out of their mouth was, don't be afraid. <laughs> Everybody calm down. Ain't no way in the world that's what showed up. <laughs> and everybody's like, ooh. <laughs> Don't get me, Gerber, baby. <laughs> so I just want to argue. Ain't no way an angel looked like that. If the first one out of the angel mouth is, Don't be terrified. Let's not get it twisted. Angels are warriors. I just say like golden warriors. Let's put an accurate picture of what the angel looked like. I bet the angel looked like that. There's... <laughs> Calm down, ain't gonna be no flagrant foul. Just calm down. That's what the angel looked like. <laughs> Said, don't be terrified. <laughs> Everybody calm down. And then after the angel showed up, he brought the whole heavenly host. And I'm trying to figure out, why do the shepherds get a heavenly host of angels? You understand, since you don't hang out with a lot of shepherds, that shepherds were the lowest in that society at the time. Shepherds were at the absolute bottom of the socioeconomic totem pole. Nobody aspired to be a shepherd. No parent was like, oh, I hope my kid grows up to be a shepherd. Shepherds smelled. Shepherds were on the fringe. Shepherds hung out with animals why in the world wouldn't the heavenly host show up to the royal elite in Rome why wouldn't the heavenly host show up to King Herod why wouldn't the heavenly host show up to the one that's been fasting and praying and studying the Torah saying when is the Messiah gonna show up how come the three wise men that actually had some money and brought gold and frankincense and myrrh how come they didn't get a heavenly host why in the world would our God my Lord and my Savior show up to the outcast Show up to the ones that were on the friends. Show up to the ones that didn't have the Instagram followers. Show up to the ones that were broken. Show up to the ones that were busted. Show up to the ones that were disgusted. Maybe he's teaching us a message in the Christmas story that this gift of Jesus is not just for the elite. This gift of Jesus is for absolutely everybody that when it comes to Jesus you don't get to pull out a red carpet and put a robe over who you think can get in and who you think should be out but I want to pause today and thank God that the message of Christmas is that everybody is worthy of the gift of Jesus Christ if you're broke you can come to Jesus if you're rich you can come to Jesus if you're depressed you can come to Jesus if you're addicted you can come to Jesus if you're a prisoner you can come to Jesus if you got issues you can come to Jesus if your issues got issues you can come to him this is all throughout your Bible. And yet people come to church talking about, I don't know if he'll accept me. Have you read the word of God? The Christmas story shows us that the shepherds that everybody else rejected, God says, I want it to be clear. My gift of my son is for everybody. Everybody is worthy of this gift. It's interesting because the angel's announcement is in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. But the Greek translation of that is a savior has been born for you. Wow. He's for you. What is the message of Christmas? Jesus is for everybody. He's for every, yo hater. Jesus is for them. Yo ex. Jesus <laughs> is for them. Somebody just left the service. <laughs> Your family that you're about to gather around the table and go, God, how am I related to anybody at this table right here? Jesus is for them. This is the message of Christmas. That's why he showed up to shepherds to let every single one of us know that this gift of Jesus is for everybody. I'm shocked and surprised by the who in the Christmas story. But I'm also shocked and surprised by the where 
Because these angels show up to these shepherds who, by the way, are in a field that is filled with sheep. They're in a field, F-I-E-L-D, that is filled, F-I-L-L-E-D, with the flock, F-L-O-C-K, <laughs> of sheep. Okay, some of y'all get in a minute. The heavenly host shows up to a bunch of shepherds who are in a field that is filled with the flock of sheep. I did my homework. It's possible it's 1,500 sheep or more out in this field. It's filled with sheep. And that's where the heavenly host show up? Okay, let me make it real plain. How many of you know uh, my dog, Journey? We just got a second dog. His name is Bruno. He's a Rottweiler. And uh, since we got our first dog, and especially now since we have a second dog, I just want to let you know, I have never in my life, since being a dog owner, opened up my back door, walked in my grass like this. <laughs> Ain't never happened. Especially now that I could, got two dogs, I walk in my backyard like this. <laughs> this is how I walk. Because I got two dogs. This field. is filled with sheep. I'm in the text. They don't visit these sheep. Text says they live there. Homie, where are you? Where do you lay the, where, Can you smell the first Christmas? That field is not just filled with sheep. It's filled with something else. And yet, in that environment, the heavenly host shows up. I'm messing with some of y'all who think that God only shows up in pristine, clean environments. I'm trying to give somebody the hope of Christmas that you can be in a life that is a mess. You can be in a situation that don't smell good and yet in the middle of that mess, in the middle of that divorce hearing, in the middle of that issue, in the middle of all those problems, how many are thankful that God doesn't need clean environments for his glory to shine, for his glory to show up? It might not smell good, but I'm thankful that the heavenly host can still show up even in the midst of a situation that doesn't smell good. I thought somebody would give God some praise, but some of y'all acting bougie in here. Does anybody know what it's like to be in the middle of a situation that is a mess and everybody can smell it, but yet somehow the glory of the Lord is filling that place. God doesn't have to show up in beautiful environments. He can show up even when it don't smell like it. Oh, I love it when I pulled up in Fair Park. Because they used to have a little cattle show. And I walked out today, I said, it smells like Christmas. Because God doesn't need perfect environments for his glory to show up. The only time the heavenly host showed up in the announcement was in a field that smelled. I don't care how stinky your situation is. The glory of the Lord can show up. You know why sheep, and more specifically shepherds, were low-class citizens? Because you don't have to be educated to be a sheep, to be a shepherd. You don't have to be educated to be a sheep either. <laughs> Here's the only thing you need to be able to do to be a shepherd. Watch it. That's all you got to be able to do. You can have one eye, be a great shepherd. That's all you got to do is watch. Every day, the mundane, I'm tired of watching these sheep. But God has a way of surprising you. When you're watching what you're watching, he'll show you something you aren't even looking for. And there they are. God, if I have to watch another one of these dumb sheep. Was that you or the sheep? I can't tell. Oh, it stinks. And the glory of the Lord shows up. I'm praying in the midst of your ordinary, mundane situations, the ones you can't stand the smell, that the glory of the Lord would show up. Watch this. 
it didn't shine on them. It was shining around them. I'm wondering, are you so deep in your pain that all you can see is the pain and you don't even realize that the glory of the Lord is around you? The fact that you got a friend you might not have family, but you got a friend. Yep. I ain't got a friend. You got a cat. <laughs> Start somewhere. <laughs> the enemy wants to focus your attention on the smell so that you miss the glory that's around you. I'm shocked and surprised by the who? Shepherds? By the where in the field and by the wind. These angels didn't show up in daylight. They showed up at night. They showed up in a dark place. I'm talking to those of you who are in a dark season right now. You don't see hope. I'm telling you that God's light shines the brightest in the dark that's why it's a holy night sometimes it takes the night to see the holy sometimes it takes the darkness to see the beauty of the light and maybe you're in a dark place and God just told me to tell you he still wants to shine the light of who he is in the dark my kids give me the best illustrations Never get Bubba coming back from a little party and he got his party bag. There's candy in there. A whistle in there that I immediately threw away. If you give a parent <laughs> and their children a goodie bag with a whistle, there's a special place. There should be a special place in jail for you because <laughs> it's a whistle. But then it was what he thought was a marker. He said, Daddy, this marker's broken. I said, Bubba, that's not a marker. I said, that's a glow stick. He said, Daddy, it, it doesn't work. I said, son, it's not going to work in the light. I said, Bubba, later tonight, it'll work. He was so excited. Tonight? I said, yeah, tonight. I was going to take him to the closet. I said, no, let me wait till it gets dark. He said, we're going to see it? I said, yeah. It gets dark. Here's Bubba. Daddy, it's, it's not working. It's not bright. I said, son, let me see it. I took that glow stick. You've been there before. And I broke it. I don't know how the chemistry works. But there's something about taking a glow stick and breaking it and shaking it that just makes it glow even brighter. I don't know who I'm preaching for, but you came all the way to church for this illustration right here. Because this has been a year that ain't been perfect. This ain't been a year where you got rose petals laid out in front of you. This has been a year where you felt like you were broken. This has been a year where you had situations that were shaking you. But I came to tell you that those light afflictions are producing a greater glory on the inside of you. And you ought to end the year not in mourning, but in praise. And say, God, thank you for everything that broke me. God, thank you for everything that shook my life because I know that it's in the shaking and it's in the breaking that I'm going to be able to shine even more. Thank God that I can see the light in the midst of the darkness. The heavenly host can't shine bright in daylight. The heavenly host needs the night to shine bright. If you're in here today and life has been breaking and life has been cracking, I need you to know, surprise, God shows up in dark places. God shows up to the least likely, to the ones who have been on the outcast. I love it because after the shepherds experienced this amazing glory, it's not like they stayed in the field. The Bible says they hurried and went to go see what the angels were talking about. In other words, it's not enough for me to be in church and just have the heavenly host singing. Now that I have experienced this moment in the dark, in the field, I must now take my own journey to go see where Jesus is. This might just be for one person today. 
God has given you evidence that he is real and that he is near. But you still have to take the step towards him. They still had to walk and go to the manger. And here's what I love. They didn't take a shower before they went. It's not like they, man, we got to take a shower. We going to stink. We got to get ourselves. No, 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 no. Maybe that's why he was born in a barn. Because he knew some shepherds were coming and wouldn't have time to clean up. And I just want to thank God that anybody can come to him no matter who you are. They fell down and they worshiped. Because all of us must make the personal decision to say, Lord, I'm following you. I'm seeking you. And so in this moment, I want to ask every head be bowed and eyes be closed. In the midst of all the surprises, in the midst of all of the kids singing today, I believe that today is somebody's sign. Maybe you have discredited yourself and said, God wouldn't show up for me. But the message of Christmas is that everybody is worthy to receive the gift of Jesus. He didn't come for just a few. He came for all. Maybe you say, well, you don't know where I am in life. He shows up in the field. <laughs> he shows up in the stinky places. He shows up in the dark seasons. But you must make a decision to say, Lord, I'm going to respond. You don't have to get yourself together to come to him. But just as you are, you have to respond. And I love that in this room, filled with thousands of people, he can see you. I have one job in our house and it is not to wrap the gifts. I can't wrap them. But I'm so good at putting a name tag on those gifts so that my kids can know with specificity which gift is for them. And can I tell you the Savior, yes, he died for the world, but he died for you. Put your name in the blank. And so with heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask you to do something that may see, seem so strange, but I think it's so necessary. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Robert, I need to surrender my life to this beautiful Savior. I'm tired of trying to do life on my own. I'm going to ask when I count to three just for you to stand to your feet. And don't worry, you're not going to stand long by yourself. Because after that, I'm going to ask everybody to stand. But I just feel like in this moment, it's important that somebody just stand up because today is your sign that he is Emmanuel, he's God with you, he's near, but you must respond to this Savior. You don't have to clean yourself up, but you must respond to what has already been done for you. So when I count to three, if you lift it up, if you, I'm sorry, when I count to three, I'm just gonna ask you to stand to your feet, not lift up your hand, but just stand straight up. If you say, I need to give him my life today. Maybe there's a season of your life, you were walking with God and your heart's gotten cold and today he's calling you back home. When I count to three, I just want you to stand from the bottom floor to the top. One, you know when God's speaking to you. Two, don't worry about what anybody else thinks. Three, would you stand right where you are? If that's you, say, I'm coming home today. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Yeah. I see hands. And I see people standing. Come on, church. Can we celebrate those who are standing all over this place up at the top? Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Yeah. Come on. Can we join those who are standing? I want everybody to stand. Everybody to stand. And I want us to pray this prayer. We're all going to say it as one big family, but especially those of you who so boldly stood up. As a matter of fact, can we do this? Just lift up your hands if you feel comfortable. I love this because this is just a sign of a surrender to a Savior saying, God, I, I can't do this on my own. We're all going to do it. Yeah, and I just want us to pray this prayer. I'm going to give you the words but you say it from your heart. Would you say this? Say, Jesus, I need you. Thank you so much for not being distant. Thank you 
for coming close. Lord, I know you've got many names. You're wonderful. You're counselor. You're mighty God. You're prince of peace. You're an everlasting father. But Lord, I thank you for being Emmanuel, God with me. Forgive me of my sin. Make me brand new. From this moment forward, I'm walking with you. Thank you for living for me. Thank you for dying for me. And Lord, I know you're coming back for me. But until that day, I will spend my days adoring you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. If you meant what you prayed, would you give God praise today? Come on, you can do better than that. Would you give King Jesus some praise today?